Um, some of you may have uh, actually seen me give some of this talk before. Um, if you do, don't spoil it. Spoil the jokes. Um, I worked really hard on those. So, um, but a little bit about me. Um, so I'd like to talk to you guys about uh, kind of API development and some of the best practices, as well as some common pitfalls to avoid uh, when you're implementing APIs for your product, for your service. Uh, maybe you're actually implementing an API as a product and it's not just consumed in-house. Uh, maybe you have third parties or other uh, consumers inside of your business, different business units maybe. Um, so I'd like to spend a little time kind of talking about, about uh, some tips to make that a very easy process and to actually make everybody enjoy it throughout the, the entire development. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, I work as a senior engineer uh, at Apto. Uh, we do commercial real estate software. We are hiring. I said it, I got to expense drinks later. All right. Uh, <laughs> so now that that's out of the way, my HR guy can get off my back. Um, I've been doing this about four years now, um, but I've been programming for about 11, kind of as a hobby. Um, you can find me here at uh, Brainchild Pro on Twitter. Uh, my GitHub is up here, as well as my username on the Never Devs group, which y'all know about, right? All right. All right. Just checking. Make sure you're awake. A little bit about my credentials and why, why you might want to actually listen to me. Um, I've built uh, a handful of self-hosted home automation software. Uh, currently work with my best friend and co-worker sitting in the back doing automation stuff. We live and breathe this. Um, also worked uh, for the US Navy as a contractor. Um, they wanted to visualize uh, energy usage across every single building um, on the planet, basically, for their their entire you know ownership. What did they own? What did they, you know? What, what were they paying the electric bill for? And they had over sixty thousand buildings that all got billed monthly, and they wanted to know who left the lights on. Uh, <laughs> so that was that was fun. Um, also, I worked for a Smokeworks project. Uh, we migrated them out of kind of like an MVP state into production ready, kind of that VO to V1 release with a lot of indoor navigation, real-time WebSocket style, uh, kind of with EC2 and some of the Redis uh, platforms on Amazon. Uh, so it was a lot of fun working with some real-time data and providing that uh, to the end user. Um, I've also done some skunk course uh, kind of consulting for Fortune 25 company. Um, so let's get into it. Um, I don't normally like to read text, but I really feel like this is worth reading. Um, so, Wikipedia defines an API as, in computer programming, an application programming interface, or API, is a set of routines, protocols, and tools for building software applications. An API expresses a software component in terms of its operations, inputs, outputs, and underlying types. It's really a mouthful, um, and I really don't expect anybody to really understand it unless you've been doing this for a while. So I'm going to break it down a little further. Uh, in practice, in your day-to-day -day development or usage of an API, it's getting system A to do work for system B. Now, what might that actually mean? <laughs> so what, what is work or do work? So an API, um, if you've ever used it, can provide detailed weather forecasts. There's services out there that will just give you the weather for a micro location. It could be your city block, and they will give you the weather for that small location. You can get in-depth directions, not just going to the web page for Google Maps. You can actually query their API and then display it how you see fit. You can use it to research new music. So if you're into kind of the music scene, getting the latest out of SoundCloud might be really interesting. You can get your house listings. I've done this because I did not like how Zillow presented their, their data, so I kind of I kind of changed it up. Uh, it broke a few terms of services, but that, that, that's really where it just that's where it really just gets going. So, what what real kinds of work can an API do? So you can control your entire production deployment via EC2, for example. You can get insight into natural language. Uh, there's a company downtown um, here called Alchemy. Um, they just recently got acquired by IBM um, to integrate with Watson. 
speaking of Watson, uh, you can actually access the Watson computing environment via an API. They provide, you know, so if you want to answer your own Jeopardy questions, you know, maybe try to beat your back. Um, it is possible. So you might be saying APIs are awesome. Um, I, I do, um, but not always. And why do I why do I caveat that? Because some of them are turn excellent. <laughs> not all APIs are created equal. Um, you might have the chance to work on some really, really well-designed APIs. There's some really nice ones that are kind of fun to work with. But you'll probably have to work on some really bad ones. <laughs> that will be the ones you get paid for. <laughs> and I, I love this. That's fantastic. So I, I challenge you to choose your destiny of sorts. Would you prefer to work with this? This is real documentation provided to uh, myself and my coworkers, um, they exported it from the SOAP service, put it into Word, then exported it as PDF, and then emailed the PDF, uh, and I think it had gotten saved or copied in between there somewhere. And this is their, their real documentation, and there's a bug in there. <laughs> and trying to get them on the phone and go, you got a bug? They're like, no we don't, no we don't, it works perfectly. Yeah. Um, this is another little example, it's a little difficult to see, but if you notice what's going on here, and actually some fellow Denver devs gave this to me, this entire thing, the security check, is comparing it to a token. It, do it doesn't care what's in the damn token. Whoop. Why? Huh? Just... <laughs> this is this is what I want to do to bad documentation. Just just go to town on it. So there are people that get this right, um, and to their credit, Marvel is amazing at marketing. They actually want members of the community to interact with their entire database of Marvel characters, the plot lines, uh, the superpowers, all the different things that you would find in the Marvel Universe, you can actually get to from their API. So, you know, maybe if you want to build a Marvel Go, I'm pretty sure you could get it done. So where, where do we get started with this? I would like to challenge you guys to avoid some common pitfalls that I found over, over the past few years. Um, and most of these I've actually seen kind of just relate from people who have never actually run into them or didn't realize they were a problem. So every millisecond that your request or your API call takes is time that adds up for your end page. So if it's a single page application or maybe it's just a live web feed of data coming into your, your application, kind of like new emails or something, every millisecond adds up and across all of your users, that time is time your users are never getting back. A little philosophical for you, but uh, not every developer has the same level of restrictions that you do. You might have the best hardware or medium class hardware, depending on where you work. Um, <laughs> but you, you get stuff done, and it's pretty consistent. It's an environment that you trust, and you you, get, you just get right in there, and all the requests come back. And there's no network problems. There's no database problems. Everything just works. It works on my machine, basically. Well, not everybody's going to have that luxury. Um, the previous documentation that I showed you with the SOAP example, uh, they had a particular request that took about 70 to 90 seconds to complete. Um, and they considered that fast because on their machine, that's how fast it ran. So they're like, we can't do anything. Uh, my coworker and I looked at them and basically said, if you just index a couple things, we'll be good. Um, they're like, no, 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 that, that, no, that won't, no. The next day, it went down to a second, two seconds for the request. Um, so just keep in mind that you got to respect the developer's time that's going to actually work with your stuff. Um, and this actually goes right into the point that I was just making. There are platforms where developers will be consuming your API that they're actually time boxed. They have, you know, let's say a maximum of two minutes. Um, and that's an actual limit uh, on the Salesforce platform of 
if you cross two minutes of whatever data processing you're doing, all of your work gets thrown away. None of it gets saved, none of it gets committed. Even if you hit the database, it all gets rolled back. So <laughs> you gotta be really cautious of those, those limits. So these transaction times are actually a really easy problem to fix. Um, so I'm gonna walk through some code. It's actually pretty, pretty straightforward. It's based on Node, if you're familiar with JavaScript. Um, but it, even if you do Ruby or something, you should be able to keep up. So I'm gonna use this example here of what could possibly go wrong in this hypothetical little request or API endpoint. Um, I'll let you look at it for a sec because I'm gonna tear it apart here. Can anybody see anything that's gonna go wrong? Is that your policy token? Which one? If not token. Yeah. So let's, let's walk through this here. So what I'm gonna recommend is you actually fail fast and you fail hard. You don't have time to waste time going to the database and coming back only to find out that you didn't have enough information to start with. So in this case, I've gone ahead and added a check to ensure that I've got enough information to make the proper query. And if I don't, I'm just going to go ahead and actually return the function. Um, this allows me to die, die really fast. Um, and when you're working in the realm of milliseconds, this, this adds up. But failing hard isn't everything. You actually want to fail gracefully. So what we've actually gone ahead and done here is now we've added status code. We are telling the developer, yes, I got your message, but something went wrong, and here's what I think went wrong. There are, are an entire Wikipedia entry, and there's multiple blogs out there on what the status codes are. Um, I suggest reading them because they're very detailed, and you can actually tell the end user a lot about what's going on. It could be a server end problem on your end. It could be a problem on their end. They could have given you bad data. They could have given you almost correct data, but you know, it just didn't pass your validations. You can express and tell that story with the HTTP status codes, which not every browser has access to, but a lot of the modern ones you'll have, you won't have a problem. So that goes right into returning 200 OK for every one of your requests is bad practice. If you're doing this, show me your API, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy you a beer because I want to know what you did. <laughs> There, there are maybe one or two use cases I can think of. This is actually a good idea, and every other case is a bad idea. And this is why. <laughs> if, if every request comes back with the same error, it all looks the same. So these status codes, I'm gonna go ahead and try to pull these up. So the Wikipedia entry has them broken down. These are the informational ones. These are the successful requests uh, of the 200 nature. You see a lot of those. Um, the 300 level uh, um, deals with redirection. So when you move service, services or file locations, uh, Google respects a lot of these codes. So you can use them to migrate you know, if you insert a new framework for your front end and you need to let Google know that your pages still exist, this is a way to do it. You get the 400 level errors. Um, we're all familiar with the 404 when we just request a file that's not there, but there's a lot more you can describe the user being unauthorized. You can describe, you know, hey, you gotta pay for this. You can't actually make this API call until we get some you know, credit card on file for your account. Um, there could be just a simple timeout. You know, if you've got a proxy in front of your, your server, this could, this could happen really easily. Um, 500 level, um, hopefully your code never gets to this point, but it does anyway. Um, that 500 level server error, we've seen it where you know, the entire website just blows up on us and we're looking at it going. I'm gonna walk away now. <laughs> <laughs> and not input that again. <laughs> um, but one of the 
uh, specifically, and I want to point this out, um, there's actually a 501. So if you're implementing new features in your API or you've got people waiting on features, you know, if you're doing like a third party development, you can actually tell their clients, hey, it's just not ready yet. And the server tells you that. You don't need some project manager to you know, convey that message. Um, the, the really fun ones are actually in this unofficial code section. Um, and so this one has just recently become official, um, I believe. So if there is a uh, legal reason that your ISP cannot show you a particular resource, you know, perhaps censorship is blocked in a country, you know, you're behind the firewall of China or something, the ISP can actually choose to send this code to you to let you know, hey, we wanted to give it to you, we're not allowed to give it to you, so we're going to blame the government so you don't get mad at us. <laughs> um, the other personal favorite that I have is this one from Twitter. Um, and if you guys can't see in the back, I will. So, yeah. Uh, it just makes me laugh, laugh so, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so, th there's a couple more that are specific to individual services. Um, and the, uh, here it is. So, 418. <laughs> this is actually real. <laughs> and I think they've only identified, and I don't know of any like open source projects, but there's actually a teapot that will do this. And it returns this code because they want it to heat up their, their water. <laughs> but it, 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 it's hysterical, honestly. So coming back to our code, um, part of failing fast, failing hard, you can leave your users with kind of a disjointed experience. So I actually would challenge you to impress them. Give them a reason. Put in an error code. It could be the HTTP status code. I don't necessarily recommend matching with that because they just got it from the browser. But, I mean, there are use cases for that as well. The, uh, the message, though, down here with this invalid user and key is actually kind of like a, hey, I understand you just had a problem. I'm trying to give you the answer on how to fix it. And when somebody's trying to rapidly rapidly like iterate over your product, that right there, just save them like 20 minutes of digging through documentation trying to figure out, why did my thing work? I know I got this right work last night. So, as far as the status code, like I said, there were one or two cases where actually not relying on the status code are actually valid. There are, uh, and specifically with the Flash platform, uh, Flash would not pass in any response that was not a 200. So if you had an error, it would stop at the Flash level. It would never hit your application. So if you're, you're sitting there writing an application in Flash, that 200 error, or that, you know, that 500 error, it never even shows up. It, that request goes out and dies. Um, so this is one of the cases where you'd want to actually do that, and you kind of just pass it in. We're going to say it's 200, we're going to give you the code inside the body so that you can work around your environment. Um, that's that stuff. Um, so I'd also challenge you to be remarkable. Operate under the principle of least surprise with developers that are going to be working with your, your product. Um, be consistent. Ensure that your error messages are all of the same tone. Make sure your documentation is all of the same tone and similar content so if they jump between one route and the other, they're looking at the same format. They don't have to actually reset their mental model in this process because they're almost always going to be on time crunch. And not necessarily just from, we got to get the request quickly, but their boss is going to be breathing down their neck. You know, you got two weeks to get this going. Hurry up. Why aren't you done? It, it happens. So make your API easy to learn. Either have it be self-describing, where the API itself describes how to get to the next resource. If you create a user, your API says, okay, if you'd like to view that user, this is the URL that you need to go to now. If your clients are listening to that, you can put whatever URL you want in that, 
and none of their products break because they just redirect because they're listening to you. So when you tell them the, the structure of your API changes, it cha they change with you. Um, and that's actually part of the Richardson's maturity model. Um, I'm going to pull this up briefly. Um, this, uh, and I've got the link for the blog post on my slides, which I'll put out on the Develop Denver channel. Um, this little graph here describes the four, five, depending on how you're counting, levels of REST. You got the first level where you are essentially calling uh, a remote procedure on somebody else's machine. You're bound to the response that they're giving you. It's kind of more of the SOAP model in that architect where you're literally calling a function on their server. The second one is the concept of resources. So you have a contact resource, you have a user resource, you have a company resource, you have a Pokemon resource, you know, whatever, whatever your specific application is, you start defining those categories at the, at the URL level. Level two, the HTTP verbs, is the concept of your get, your put, your post, your delete, and actually I think there's like seven or eight other verbs, but we only ever use the four. Um, but this level two is the concept of I want to create a Pokemon. I want to update that Pokemon. I want to go ahead and delete that resource that I've put up there. You know, it could be media, it could be any of your business logic going on, but you describe it using just a simple verb. The third or fourth level um, is the ability to actually change what type of media you send back to the client based on what they've requested. So if they're looking for JSON, you send them JSON. But this could be very easily uh, inferred as, you know, oh, they want a CSV version of this data. Your API just sends them CSV because they've requested a different file type. Um, it could be HTML. So your JSON endpoint could generate HTML output. So the concept of being able to switch your file types at this level is really useful for people that have you know, different use cases for, for your data. And then the fourth slash fifth, fifth level, um, the glory of rest. Um, in this article, um, Richardson is actually making the argument that almost nobody makes it to this level. Um, and honestly, in the wild, I have yet to really see an example of the rest. Because um, a lot of people try to kind of accumulate all of these into what REST is when really it's something a little, a little more lofty than, than most people expect. Um, does anybody have any questions at the moment before I can continue? Yes? <laughs> uh, how about versioning your API? I usually see that happen in the route, but I've also seen uh, you can request it in the actual headers. So what I would suggest as long as you're consistent, it doesn't matter. Um, so don't do version one headers, version two URL. Just be consistent or even support both. Um, the pattern that I've seen the most of is actually where um, the version is in the URL, but if it's missing, it defaults to the most recent version, which allows you to support backwards compatibility and allows your sales team or whatever to say, hey, we're going to phase this out. You've got six months to get off our API and then we're shutting it down. So, anything else? Yes? Do you know why more of the HTTP verbs aren't in use? Um, I think it's actually more because of the browser wars. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, they chose to support the main four um, and past that, it just didn't go very far. Um, they're pretty. Uh, on the far edges of kind of the, the mainstream use case anyway, but they're there to describe things that you could do with HTTP. So, yes? Do you have any opinions on how many resources should be on a single API? So, you're a company XYZ, and you want to know what the max resource is your widget API can have? Or is it, yeah, if you're building an API, um, is it, uh, do you have, would you 
if you have a bunch of stuff that you need to expose, would you put it all under one API or different subdomains or different? So there's several different ways that I think you can actually solve that. Um, I would actually challenge you, how many can you maintain on one API? And I would make that the max. Um, if you start putting resources that you can't maintain out there, you're going to introduce kind of a subpar experience for the developers that are using your API. Um, now, specifically as far as, you know, like what subdomains, like I would keep them all on one actual server, so you can actually spin them all up and load balance them statically, and it doesn't matter which, which endpoint you actually hit. If you find that there's uh, kind of like a amalgamation of resources that you need for a specific service, but none of them actually meet, I would actually proxy a new API, where it's reaching out to the other APIs and microservicing it kind of behind that wall, and then you've got the exact kind of data model that your, your new app actually requires. So, yes. What is it the true like uh, REST contains that the other four levels don't? So, it is, it, and the, the, the blog post actually goes pretty in-depth in this, so I'll just kind of skim it. Um, what he's actually making the argument for is that it's this theoretical, ideal, really nice to be in place, um, but APIs tend to fall short, like they focus, and rightly so, they focus on areas that make sense to them, and so they kind of leave off, you know, the hypermedia controls. You know, that might not be a priority uh, for a particular company. So they focus on, I want to make sure I'm good with my resources, I want to make sure I'm good with the verb usage, and making sure that everything is clear, transparent. Um, so, and that's, that's why I said, like, I haven't actually seen anybody that's hit that last level. Um, I think it's just so philosophical, almost. Like, it's, it's a really nice goal to, like, aim for, because just the thought of getting there is, like, your, your API is self-describing. It is almost self-healing. It is very clear to understand. You don't necessarily need documentation for it because it documents itself. Um, so there's like all these little pieces that come together to make that echelon, upper echelon of, you know, pressed. Anybody else? Cool. So I would actually like to suggest a couple tools uh, for success. Um, one of the tools that I've actually found to be very useful um, in developing a brand new API or even refactoring an API is actually opening up a plain text editor. So notes in this example. And just writing out, what do I want these to look like? What are my resources? What do I expect a user to be able to do? I mean, you might need some user stories or something in your hand uh, to go ahead and get that done, but uh, it, it's, it's very refreshing to just stare at a blank text document and go, all right, I, I, I want to do this right from the start. One of the other tools that I've found to be very helpful is actually Trello. Um, I tend to make a card per route. So if it's a get contacts, that's a card. If it's a delete contacts, that's a card. And then if it's a get a single contact and you know, or get a single contacts media, each one of those is a card. That way I can run it through more of a kind of like a Kanban style workflow where it's design, research, making sure that I understand what inputs and outputs should be met on each resource. That allows me to do it really quickly. One of the other tools that I found really useful um, in debugging and developing APIs is Postman. Um, it was 10, 15 bucks, I think, last year when I bought it. It's I free. Is it free now? There might be like a pro yeah. that does something better, but it's a free Chrome app. Well, I pay you for that, so I'm going to promote this, even if it's free, go, go enjoy. Um, but you actually can set up some almost integration tests inside of Postman, and you can have it run all of your tests. So if you want to test 
the ability to add to a route or delete from a route, you can actually just do it all from here. Now, I understand you can actually do that through code, um, but sometimes it's actually really nice to just put it inside of this, this GUI and everything just works for you. One of the other tools that I would recommend is this tool called Swagger.io. Now, what Swagger is, is, is mostly a standard for describing an API, and they've actually gone ahead and written several tools that actually graphically will display your, your description, basically. So for this particular API, we've got the concept of hosting a user, we've got the concept of a user logging in, and we've got the concept of deleting a user, and they've actually broken it out into each of the verbs. So you visually get to see, okay, this is a positive addition, this is a neutral addition, this is a negative addition to my, my data, and so you know, for each one of your resources, you can have those same types of interfaces to kind of describe it. You can actually hand this to your kind of like documentation team. They can actually embed some of this stuff into the documentation. So if your API can generate the output that this requires, you can just point your documentation at it and it's always, always up to date. So it's really, really useful um, and really pushes towards that, that higher level of rest because it, it's great documentation, it stays up to date if you set it up correctly, um, it allows you to see visually both what your resources are, what you can do with your resources, and you'll quickly start noticing when you start visualizing it like, like this, well I can create on this route, why can't I create on this route? So if you're missing any basic routes, you'll actually start to see that. They also make several other tools um, for success. Uh, they've got some server integrations, uh, some basic services you can work with. Um, they've got actual code generators that will take your documentation and generate something that knows how to interact with your code. Um, the editor, you actually can design the API right in the editor, um, and it will put out um, I think if you if you use the editor and one of the generators, it'll, you can actually create like your node code or your Rails code to match what you design in the UI. So that's really cool. And then, like I already pointed out, uh, the Swagger UI. So one of the other resources that I'd like to point out is this programmable web. If you've never been here, it is a great resource. They blog about APIs, they're watching all the news about popular APIs. They are providing kind of reviews, almost like a Yelp review of like how easy or how difficult it is to actually work. With, um, so kind of getting involved with the community. Um, I'll pull this up here. Um, just, just here on this first page. They've got descriptions of the Google Maps, the Twitter API, you've got Flickr, Facebook, Amazon, there's some Twillow. Uh, let's see what else we got here. We can do eBay, Microsoft Bing, uh, the Google App Engine, Foursquare. So the amount of resources that are out there, and I'll actually pull one of these up. They give you all of the links, if they, if they have them. They give you all of the links on where you need your documentation, what type of authentication to expect. Um, there are actually undocumented APIs in here. So they actually track, is this an official API? Are you actually allowed to use this? Or did somebody like cobble this together because they read through the source code? Um, as well as you know where to find SDKs to work with the APIs, um, articles and blog posts on how to actually work with it. So things that they've written, community written, um, as well as some sample source code, the other developers that are using this. So if you've got, you know, people that you're trying you're trying to find out details about a specific API, you can actually reach out and you know see who's actually using it. So the heat threw off my sense of time. So.